just wanted to welcome everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located, uh, joining Granular for this presentation. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of content. We'll try and be quick here, but as comprehensive as possible. Uh, so the, the, the topic here is four keys to successful Google ad campaigns for higher ed marketers. Um, on this uh, webinar, the three hosts you have here um, are Jordan Meyer, our president and our founder, uh, John Chan, who's an agency development manager for Google, who uh, is going to be able to shed uh, insight and uh, share his expertise from the Google side. And then uh, myself, Steve Crom, the vice president here at Granular. So the agenda, we're going to just talk very briefly about how we work with universities and schools, uh, Jordan's background, um, and then we're going to jump right into the content and we're going to wrap up. Uh, we do have a lot of content to cover, but in the event that we do have time, we will try and answer any questions. You can ask questions at any point throughout the webinar. Uh, you can go ahead and use the Q&A feature or in the chat if you want to ask your questions. Um, in the event we are not able to answer your questions, we will absolutely make sure we can follow up with you. And if you have any technical difficulties, we have our colleague Jamie Meyer. She is uh, uh, on this as well. If something happens, you can email her at jamie at granularmarketing.com. So I'm going to turn it over to Jordan just to talk about how we work with universities and schools. All right. Thanks, Steve. So one of the reasons we're here talking about higher ed is because of my background. Um, you know, I was in, I've been in paid search my entire career. Um, I started out in house on the e-commerce side, and then I went to a few agencies, got a broad range of experience there. Um, and then back in house for a few stints. And I finally started granular. That's the short story. Um, the, Part of the story I do want to zoom in and highlight on, though, is uh, when I was in-house a few years ago, um, I was at, uh, I got the opportunity to work for a couple for-profit colleges and universities up in the Twin Cities. Um, my first higher ed stint, I was actually brought in to fire an agency, uh, oddly enough. Um, I was at Best Buy, had a good gig, um, but I wanted some more autonomy. I wanted to control the the search strategy a little more and this college uh had all the right things for me so i got in um kicked out the agency that was charging them thirty thousand dollars a month just to manage their accounts uh and within a few months broke records and um did a, a phenomenal job there <laughs> so much so that they were pretty mad when i left and uh went to a larger university system up there um, where I was able to manage six uh, college and university brands under their system. Um, it included some traditional schools, um, but also some vocational training schools as well. So I got a, a lot of good experience there. Um, the cool thing about working in-house for a college or university was that I was able to speak to admissions weekly. Um, I met with financial aid often. Um, I even worked to develop new degrees and find new campus locations. Um, and we were able to do that. We were able to help the, the deans and, and the leaders on the um, education side of, of the college, the academic side, um, based on a lot of the data that we were able to get from our own research, but also from Google's research um, to really sniff out you know, what degrees are up and coming what the school should develop, and then even find the, the new campus locations based on demand um, and potential students. So that was phenomenal. Um, I also had the luxury of working with some very large budgets, um, you know, a million a quarter, upwards of three billion a quarter um, spent on digital. Um, the wild thing about that was we were still hitting budget caps. So it's really cool to see how much demand is out there for um, for schools and how much you can capture, even if your budget's huge. Um, we weren't able to capture all the demand out there. I mean, we were generating uh, 100, 150 leads a day, uh, getting multiple people to enroll every day. Um, and that was uh, pretty phenomenal. And to know that there's bigger colleges out there like you know Phoenix and, and those huge systems um, just shows that 
people are out there using Google, um, looking for colleges to attend. And if you do it right, you can really capture them pretty easily. Um, so after the that, after uh, while I was working at the university, um, rather than jumping around again and being a bad employee, <laughs> uh, I decided to start Granular uh, full time. And we're here, we've been here for six years uh, in Milwaukee. Um, we work with companies around the world, e-commerce, B2B, um, but higher ed is, is a passion of mine. Um, while working in-house at these, these colleges and universities, I was really able to understand, even though we were a for-profit, I was able to see us change some lives and um, really fulfill people's goals um, of getting a degree. So it's while paid search is passion number one of mine, uh, higher ed is a close second. And that's why we built this practice in granular. It's not only me with all of this experience in higher ed, um, I've also assembled a team that has additional experience working with uh, colleges and universities. And you'll hear from a couple of those guys later on. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a cool journey and we really think we can help um, higher ed uh, get better at their marketing or really discover new ways to, to find potential students. And we just got to plug a little bit of how we help um, colleges and universities and, and even, you know, private high schools and vocational training. Um, we can do a lot of things. There's a lot of ways we can help. We can audit, augment, or fully manage, um, and lots of things in between. But we, we work with uh, in-house teams quite often. Um, it's not a bad thing to bring in an agency to help and to, to augment and amplify what you're doing already. Um, we've also audited plenty of accounts where um, we can give a free quick audit or we can really dive in and produce a 20, 30, 40 page audit that is basically a playbook on how to fix your paid search and how do you um, improve the results. Um, and then all the way, our service you know, ranges all the way up to full management, which we do quite often. That's kind of our, our main thing where uh, we'll work with, with schools for years uh, and continuously try to improve, uh, you know, month over month and year over year results by really owning the channels that we manage and uh, taking, you know, full responsibility for driving enrollments. And I'll pass this over to Steve to talk a little bit more about how we can help. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, super helpful background. Jordan, uh, like you alluded to, we will have two other colleagues from Granular who will be uh, kind of guest guest presenting some of their findings, just two slides here, and then we're going to get into some of these insights I know you guys are interested in. So um, some benefits working with our team. I think Jordan hit on this. You know, we aren't a, a, a group that just has dabbled a little in higher ed pay-per-click because we do have that strong subject matter expertise uh, in pay-per-click uh, across, you know, uh, search, social, uh, video, uh, 20 plus different platforms that we use, we can get very deep and uh, we can give specific insights into specific degree programs where we can help you. We can, you know, all the different um, types of geo-targeting, geo-fencing, geo-framing, basically anything where you're looking to target, you know, student uh, specific populations um, based on uh, the, their location, uh, based on their intent, we're going to be able to do that for you. And uh, while we really uh, think of ourselves as a performance agency, I think you know, John May from Google, he may even you know, say that that's a category of agency that they really look at granular as being. We are looking at the full funnel approach. I think Jordan has some slides about that coming up. And uh, you can't uh, measure what you can't track. So we're really proud of our um, practice when it comes to our analytics tag manager, data studio, our ability to work with all the different CRMs that uh, higher ed works with, kind of the well-known ones as well as these very niche ones and getting it all to speak to your ad platform analytics, getting it to connect to um, your CRM and then helping you make sense of that data so you can surface insights. So we are in slide one here of the, the section. So uh, just to let you guys know again, we're going to cover the four uh, keys to uh, uh, success for hired marketers. And Jordan's going to go ahead and take Q1 
key number one here, which is uh, don't sleep on Google search. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so as Steve mentioned, I mean, we manage well over 20 paid channels, um, including, you know, connected TV and programmatic and um, everything throughout the funnel. Um, but I think it's really important. And this is based off experience of taking over plenty of accounts and seeing that people tend to sleep on search a little too much. Um, it's still the number one channel to, to leverage intent in order to capture demand. You, you know, quite literally have people going there to find colleges and degrees and um, trying to find, you know, information about the certain degree programs, but also how to apply and what's it cost and what are the outcomes. Um, people go to Google and, and other search engines to do this. And that's why we spend nearly 80% of our budgets on, on search ads. Um, you know, how I mentioned that, you know, we worked with, or I personally worked with some of the, the largest higher ed budgets. Um, that was still a lot of lower funnel um, search. And while we had the luxury of spending on, on higher funnel uh, channels, um, we still saw just plenty of demand being captured uh, through search. And it's often where the journey starts. Um, so I think it's really important to be there when a potential student starts their, their journey of either going back to school or um, if it's a traditional college, uh, you know, starting to look you know, in, in when they're in high school or when their parents start to look. And uh, over 50% of, of those journeys start on mobile, by the way. So um, it's hypercritical to be there and to have a good experience um, because uh, prospect, prospective students aren't just uh, on a desktop at a, at a desk searching for colleges. Uh, they're most likely uh, sitting on the couch, streaming TV and also looking at their phone. Uh, or tablet, and um, it's really important to be there when uh, when they're looking. Um, another reason not to sleep on search is just because it's so measurable. Um, from the click to the visit to the uh, first conversion to uh, an actual online application, you can measure every touch point and every micro conversion that leads to an actual student starting. Um, it's it's the most measurable channel out there while we fully believe in uh you know terrestrial tv and radio and billboards and bus wraps um it, it's all important but it's not nearly as, as measurable or accountable as as search um and the last bullet point here is that we just get we get so much data back to us that creates this this brilliant cycle of uh, testing and, and optimizing and continuously improving um, what we're bidding on, who we're, you know, the audience that we're getting in front of, um, how we're measuring success. Um, we get so much data to leverage through search that uh, it's really hard to ignore how powerful it is. So another reason here is it's, it's a low barrier to entry. Not that it's necessarily cheap um, or easy, but the barrier is so low. Um, of course, we see people just fire up new ad accounts and uh, mismanage them. Um, and that's, that's why we're here to, to make things better. Um, but the real key to what I'm trying to get across here is that you can have you know, three colleges on the right here, just a quick example, just a, a raw search that I did the other day. Um, a nursing degree is a very valuable thing to a college. Um, and to show here that there's three very different colleges um, advertising for the same degree. And we know that there's three very different levels of budget that they have to spend within Google or, or, or Bing um, or just on marketing in general. But the budget isn't what counts on this example on the right. It's really about the bid. It's about um, you know getting granular with the targeting. You know, making sure that you're playing within your own geography or you're playing within a small enough geography to afford it. Um, you have a, a good message. You have well-crafted ads. You have well-crafted landing page experience after the fact. Um, 
it's a low barrier to entry because a smaller college can play with the big guys and you can show up for the exact same search as they are. Though That's the rule within Google, right? You don't have to spend a million dollars a quarter to be here. Um, but if you're good, if you're smart, if you're measuring what success actually looks like, um, you can play in as big a category as you want. And that's the really cool thing about, about search. So another thing to keep in mind is while search can and, and PPC can take a lot of credit um, for conversions, uh, we're not we're not Target, right? Every time you walk into Target, you walk out with something. Um, I don't think I've ever been to a Target without buying something. They have a near 100% conversion rate. It's a beautiful thing. Um, unfortunately, our websites, your, your college and university website isn't the same. Most of the visits don't result in a conversion. Um, but the important thing to, to keep in mind is, and the important thing of having, having a partner like us that actually understands the, the student journey is that it takes multiple visits and multiple brand engagements um, to really you know, lock in on, on this potential student, bring them back time and time again to your site, hit them with good content um, and be where they are on whatever device they're on uh, so that search can close the deal. Because we often do see paid search start and end the journey, but it's really important to consider what's in the middle. And I'll touch a bit on that on the next slide. So to close out my section here, um, I think it's really important that you don't sleep on search because, um, you know, we need to stop treating it like it is the first and last engagement. Um, there's a lot that goes in the middle. And this is just a, a you know, example that I came up with, um, but it's very similar to things that are, are true out there. Um, you know, someone might from their couch search on general branded or non-brand college, right? Like, how do I go back to college? Can I go back to college as an adult? Or if I'm a you know, 15 year old, how do I apply to college? You know, what's, what's in it for me? So now they might go to your site, they educate themselves on what's available, they see an interesting degree, um, but now they're curious, who else offers that degree? Is there a college I don't know of? Is there a college that's more convenient or more affordable? So now they might know your brand, they might know the degree they want, but there's so many things in between. How do I pay for this? What's the admissions process? What's the graduation rate? Does this school just, you know, bring a bunch of students in and never graduate them? What's the earning potential of this degree I'm looking at? Um, there's so many questions to answer and search is where people find their answers oftentimes. So it's really important to not only be that first touch for awareness and that last touch to get an application and a new student, it's really important to cover the middle as well. And I think that's what sets um, good paid search marketers apart from, um, from rookies or just not experienced. Um, you have to understand the full life cycle, the full funnel of a new student. And uh, that's what we try to do here. Obviously you can bid and, and capture a lot of lower funnel stuff, but if you don't go up that funnel, you're not gonna capture a larger student base. You're not gonna grow the university. And especially now when it's so competitive with, uh, with, with COVID and everyone looking to, to learn online, um, it's even more important to cover that middle funnel now and budget for it and, uh, and measure it. So thanks for listening to me talk a lot. Um, we've got some good stuff coming up. Uh, John's gonna inform us a little bit about attribution. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, like you mentioned, we're going to go ahead and hand it off to John Chan, uh, and he's going to talk about getting attribution right. I know that um, makes it seem like, hey, there will be a definitive solution. That's really not what we're looking to do here. I think it's uh, just, uh, it'll be good to hear from John to talk about what to take into consideration. Sure. Take it away, John. You. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. Uh, so my name is John Chan. As, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, I'm the agency development manager for Granular. Uh, and the reason that 
I'm just a small part of Granular's team that works with Google. And the reason that we have um, this team or the reason that I have a job is because I think, you know, we don't disclose it publicly, but the, the latest number that I could get was from 2015. And Google has, at that, at that time, external research had that we had 4 million advertisers on our ad platforms. Uh, I'm sure that number has grown, but as you can imagine, we cannot have direct relationships with each of our advertisers because there's just, there's too many. And so um, agencies like Granular allow us to scale the support that we bring through our products. So they are the experts um, and our, our premier partners are the experts in search, display, and YouTube. Um, they are, and just to give you a little bit more background on the program, um, you know, they are the experts and you know, to be a premier partner, we require them to keep up their certifications, keep up, keep up their performance and best practices. Um, but the advantages of that to, to Granular and to the, uh, all of our premier partners and the advertisers that they work with, they get early access to betas um, and some of our latest products so that they become experts and can use them. I, I think Ian's going to talk about responsive ads a little, during, a little further down the line. These are some of the things that uh, you know, the granular team had access to before that was rolled out to the rest of the public. Um, and a couple of the other things we we're going to talk about are, are the data and research that Google does. And so that's part of my job is bringing those resources to our premier partners. So um, as you know, uh, I don't have to tell anybody here that that, that uh, journey from exploration and fact finding uh, to the application start, to the enrollment, to class starting, and eventually, and hopefully graduation is very complicated. Uh, Jordan alluded it, to it a little bit earlier, um, but there is a ton of data and there's a, a large messy middle from that very first search into you know, becoming a lead or, or completing that application. A few years ago, Google with Ipsos did a, a, a longitudinal study for seven months that included thousands of students in surveys, hundreds of discussion groups, um, and then some voluntary click stream data. So tracking people that opted in into having their journey tracked um, and, and reported on. So when we talk about the messy middle, it's, this is a little bit of an extreme, but in this particular case study from this, this research, um, uh, single mother, single mother, 35 years old, looking into a business degree. 132 Google searches that had to do with higher education, 764 school page visits, um, 116 career or financial aid page visits. So understanding what the impact of of that degree could possibly be, in addition to how do I pay for this. Um, and then something that we've seen continue to grow is the role in YouTube and video um, when it comes to uh, deciding upon where or, or getting ideas where to apply to schools and 76 uh, social page visits. Um, understanding that complex journey is, you know, it's impossible for us to, to go down the rabbit hole of understanding each of these individual user journeys. But that is why um, you know, Google exists and, and we bring our technology to the forefront um, with, uh, with our Google Ads products. And so we use that to measure and make better decisions on reaching the potential students for you. Um, so in that, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, attribution and so, we talked about a very extreme user journey there. For a typical Google user, if they were to convert, confer, con, excuse me, convert on an e-commerce site, typically clicking on about four ads. So we're going to use it a very, very basic model here to, to talk about attribution. Last click attribution is someone who searches for your school. Uh, they come to the application page. They land on that application page from an ad. That's awesome. You have a lead. But last click attribution is saying all of that, that ad is 100% res responsible for uh, um, that application, which is that's, that's the equal of saying, if you go into a store and buy something and you see the parking sign or you see the sign from across the parking lot, 
that 100% of the reason that you went into that store is because of that big sign? Are you going to dump in all of your marketing resources into getting a bigger and bigger sign for your store? No, we can do, um, we do it across many different ways. And so the, sort of in the next model is thinking about um, what we call rule-based rule or linear, in this case, a linear attribution model. This out allows us to subjectively attribute credit across all touch points. So in this case, linear, everything is created equal, which is again, it's better because we are getting an idea of, um, or we are attributing multiple stages in that consumer journey uh, to get to that lead. To further the store example, you know, we are equally attributing credit to uh, the, the TV ad, the newspaper ad, uh, the radio spot, and then finally, you, they get to the address, they look across that parking lot, and you see the sign, and now you're splitting all of your marketing dollars across each of those touch points. That makes a little more sense than having a giant sign, but again, we are at the point where we can use data to drive our decisions. And so today, what the gold standard is, is data-driven attribution, what we call DDA. Now, DDA relies on Google's algorithms and machine learning to determine how much credit to apply to all of these touch points. As we mentioned before, it's not just four, when it, especially when it comes to higher ed, it's multiple touch points, um, you know, uh, potentially thousands across months. You know, this is objective data. So in, in a linear or rules-based model, we are choosing the model in which we attribute things. With Google and the algor algorithms that we have, we take into account uh, the different paths that each of these people take uh, with the clicks that they have and which um, lead to an actual conversion. But we also take into account, conversely, the paths that don't lead to a conversion. So that is feeding into our data-driven model that is updated constantly and that eventually helps us to, to bid more efficiently. And to close out my very tortured a uh, store analogy, this is if somebody comes in and buys your something in the store after all of those touch points, they fill out a comprehensive uh, survey of, um, you know, when, how did they first find out about the store? What ad did they see? Um, you know, how did they get there? Uh, you know, how much of the, how prominent was the sign? Not only that, data-driven attribution also understands all of the people that were thinking about going to your store, but ended up not going there as well. So you get both sides of that information. So, you know, it's a complex journey and it requires complex technology and the people that know how to handle it and bid effectively so that you can get to your prospective students um, effectively and efficiently. Perfect. Thanks, John. And I think that's a, it's a great segue. Um, so to move away from your store analogy model, if we're talking the world where, you know, fr from our experience, if you ask uh, individuals who engage with your ads or your website or fill out form how you heard about us, we typically don't trust what they tell you. So instead, we make sure that we track everything that we can. I talked about this uh, earlier that we uh, really push hard to make sure we've got a really strong practice when it comes to tagging and tracking and Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, uh, making sure that uh, phone calls, form submissions, those are no brainers to track, but you know we can track uh, engagements on the website, people who are clicking through photo galleries, who are looking at videos, who are engaging with chat bots. You know, there's the tech, technological know-how. We definitely could do that. We have a whole blog post our colleague Mark wrote, which is uh, very popular. The uh, main Google Analytics uh, Twitter profile retweeted it and they shared it because they thought it was such a good article. It was, uh, it's been crazy from a attention standpoint, but that's really only one part of the equation. We need to be able to have those conversations with you on what uh, are the behaviors that lead us to believe that um, they're indicative of the type of success you're looking for. Being able to implement uh, the, the DDA model that can help surface some of those insights. I think that's what's valuable is, you know, you can go through the exercise. We've all been through it, but when you're leaning on 
uh, that data-driven attribution model, that can really help as a jumping off point to say, hey, here's what Google is saying, all the different ways that uh, individuals are engaging with you, and it leads to really productive uh, conversations. And um, kind of, you know, we've talked about how important it is to, you know, uh, drive leads, but we know that uh, your institutions, you as marketers uh, working, and those of you working in enrollment, you really are looking at, you know, Look, looking beyond the lead, my colleague Mike, who's going to be speaking next, is going to talk about you know, that that balance. Um, but for us, you know, I alluded to this earlier. You know, we, you know, as as a baseline, we make sure that uh, everything is being tracked in the platforms, analytics, tag manager. Uh, but you know, how do we make sure we incorporate their your CRM data? How do we bring in your marketing automation data? Uh, how do we bring in uh, some of that? unstructured data that we can incorporate. That's something that we've really been able to uh, to do and we're really proud of. And it gives that more complete picture of how uh, Google Ads drives enrollments. And so um, that's something that uh, if you have any questions specific to that or anything else, obviously we'll uh, be happy to answer that when we have time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, have my colleague uh, Mike here uh, go ahead and let him jump in because he's going to talk about our next key, which is uh, team collaboration. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over you to you, Mike. Mike, you want to go ahead and say something? Make sure we can hear yes, you. I'm here. All right, perfect. Going to yeah. turn it over to you, Mike. All right, thanks, Steve. Yeah, um, all important uh, aspect of uh, having successful digital uh, marketing campaigns within higher ed, I think, is. Uh, the team collaboration aspect, right, between uh, really three three departments in, in this whole scenario, which is the agency, uh, the marketing department, and enrollment. Um, and it's a, I think it's really important for those teams to collaborate at a high level. And the reason um, for that is especially because of one thing I want to point out, and that's that all leads aren't created equal, right? So we already talked about um, how all touch points aren't equal and, and the attribution can be different. And, and you know, going through this, this research uh, phase and, and deciding where to go to school can be quite the process. Well, you know, people that go through that process can, can uh, contact you for more information at, at any point in that process, right? And so all leads really aren't created equal. And the, the factors that go into that are things like what channel they come from. Right, so when we look at a channel like search, um, search lends itself more to someone that right has an intent, has a need that's more pressing typically, um, and timing typically tends to be better um, on average. Now, there's still some people, like we said, that will start their journey, their long journey, by doing a search and end it by doing a search. But you know, more often than we see from a channel like social, we see someone in search might do a search, um, get more information, apply and enroll within a sh very short amount of time. Now, certainly that's not the majority of people, but it does happen. So overall though, on average, search creates a situation where there's a quicker consideration cycle, right? Now that's a, a big advantage, right? To enrollment because, hey, they're more likely to interact with me. They're more likely to you know, answer my calls, things like that. The disadvantage that we see with search though, is that it can be a mixed audience, right? You can have a situation where you don't actually know who's doing the search. It could be your target prospect. It could be their parents. It could be uh, like Jordan mentioned, a 15 year old just wondering about colleges in the area. Um, it could be someone that's ready to enroll this month. You know, So it's really a mixed bag. Um, when you look at the social channel, it's kind of the opposite, right? So your audience tends to be more highly targeted. Um, when you think about a channel like LinkedIn, where if you're promoting, for example, a master's of education degree, uh, you can target teachers that don't have a master's in education, right? Perfect audience. The difference with social though, is that it's a longer consideration cycle, right? People get onto social platforms uh, to do things like catch up with their friends or to right, interact with their, their networks. Um, 
their business networks. And so you've got a, a more, you can have a more highly targeted audience, but they're not necessarily ready to engage with you at a high level yet. So they might want more information and become a lead, but it doesn't mean they're ready to apply and enroll. Um, and so those consideration cycles are longer in general. Um, the thing about social though, like Jordan mentioned previously that, you know, 80% of budgets, right, are spent on search. Um, well, in an auction environment, you can imagine that that creates more expense, right? Higher costs, things like that. Um, and there's tremendous ROI in search, right? Because of the need and timing aspect. But if you look at it, if you work social leads correctly, uh, you're definitely going to get a cheaper cost per lead, right? Because the competition tends to be lower. Um, but the question then becomes, are you going to get a cheaper cost per application? And are you going to get a cheaper cost per enrollment? And really what I'm trying to say in this point is if your teams can collaborate on the right level and understand what channels your, your prospects and your leads are coming from and what, and how that might inform how you treat those leads, how you work them and what your expectations are of them, um, then you can have, right. Uh, uh, a cheaper or, um, or similar cost per enrollment as you would see in search. So the difference is not, we're not talking about here, one is better than the other. We're talking about they're different, right? All leads aren't created equal. And so it's not just the channel, right? It's also how you capture a lead that's gonna affect its quality, right? So uh, on the left side, you see a situation where you might use a landing page, right? And on that landing page, you'll have a form that they need to fill out. And the call to action of that form is to get more info or apply now, right? That's more of a, hey, do business with us type of situation. Well, someone that fills out that form that goes to that landing page and fills that form out Right, is going to be much more serious about engaging with you um, than other people. And then you've got the factor of are you are you requiring a phone number on your form, right? How are you capturing what are you requiring? Well, if you require a phone number and they give you their phone number, especially in today's day and age, right? That means, wow, they're really serious. So those leads tend to be higher quality. On the opposite side, uh, most digital platforms now are coming out with what's called lead gen forms. And lead gen forms are basically when they click on your ad on the platform, they come to a form that's not your landing page. It pops up on the platform. Information is already filled in for them, their information that they've supplied to the platform. And all they need to do is hit submit. Well, this makes it really, really easy, right? To become a lead or to get more information, which makes your, your conversion rates go up, makes your lead volume go up. Um, but when you're, when it's so easy to become a lead, um, people might even not remember they submitted the form. Like that's what we hear from some people is, you know, we call the, our, our leads that, that fill out these lead gen forms and some of them say they don't even remember submitting it. Right. So you're, you might uh, be sacrificing quality to get more volume. Right. And, and if you capture that lead by having a download, right, it's not get more information or apply, but it's a download and you don't require a phone number, right? You're making it really, really easy. So the point is, not only does the channel does someone come from matter in terms of what the quality is and maybe how that uh, lead should be treated, um, but also the way it's captured is going to affect that. And so what happens when your teams, right, the agency, the marketing department, the enrollment uh, department, when they don't collaborate together, you get this constant tension, right? When they're not on the same page, enrollment's saying marketing's giving us bad leads and enrollment's looking at the lead source. And if it's if from Google, they're going to call it right away. If it's from another, you know, platform, they're going to say, oh, those tend to stink, you know, because they don't enroll right away. And, um, and so your enrollment counselors understanding what what should this process be that I should work this lead and um, being on the same page is important. And then of course, on the other side, you know, marketing um, is, is looking at all the leads they're driving, right? And, and but enrollment isn't converting them at, at, at the rate they need to be converting them. Um, and so if you're not on the same page, you, you're kind of talking past each other, right? And you're playing this tug of war with each other and, and that's not productive uh, at all. So collaborating together is really what's gonna create the best results. And so when you look across these three entities, the areas of collaboration that are important, right? 
we all need to be on the same page with what should our strategy be, right? Where, what channel should we be on? What should our cap capture methods be? And not only what they should be, but maybe we're testing multiple channels and multiple ways of capturing. Well, how should we, we be working those leads? What should we expect from those leads in terms of time decay? How, how many calls are we putting in? How long are we working these leads? Things like that. What, what are our enrollment processes? And then, you know, like was mentioned earlier, circling back around where you get that data, right? Circling back around to the agency and to the marketing department. Okay, what do we do with this data now to, to inform our strategy? So like Jordan mentioned earlier, it's a cycle going on of, you know, strategy, campaigns, data, communication, collaboration together. Um, how are we working these things? And then cycling back, uh, you know, to strategy and, and tweaking and optimizing. So there you have it. Those are, those are some tips. I think team collaboration in these areas is a huge key to, uh, to success with these uh, digital marketing campaigns. Thanks, thanks Mike, uh, appreciate that. I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and mute you for now. Um, but well, we're gonna go ahead and bring you back for the Q&A section here. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into the, the next session. And we couldn't go through, we originally said, hey, three keys to success. We're all living with COVID. And this is something I know that is very top of mind for everyone here on this call. So we wanted to have a specific section to talk about what we've seen here at Granular and how we've adapted with our clients uh, during COVID. And then also John uh, has a contribution as well from the, the Google side, some useful information. So uh, for this, I'm going to uh, have my colleague Ian uh, go ahead and jump in. Ian, uh, can you go ahead and speak so I can confirm I can hear you? Hello. Hey, all right, perfect Ian. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Yeah, so in March, around the start of the pandemic, um, across, and I think everyone saw this across several accounts, we saw, saw a big drops in traffic um, during with performance. And during those times, um, I took a little deeper um, look at things and try to challenge, challenge some biases I have um, with the team has um, to try and see what we're uh, doing wrong, um, see if there's anything uh, that I thought, you know, didn't work before or that I, I dismissed before, see if that can help things turn around. Um, and it's, there are definitely some things that we saw here with responsive ads, bidding strategies that <clears throat> I dismissed before, but I think have helped turn around some of the higher education accounts around have really helped performance. Um, so the first one with testing responsive ads where you haven't. Um, so we have a, a blog post from well at the beginning of res when responsive search ads were rolled out um, by one of the other managers uh, talking about responsive search ads and showed that RSAs were just performing worse um, 16% worse click-through rate, um, we saw worse conversion rates across the board. And that was for early 2019. Um, going back, we're seeing that since then, especially in the early part of the pandemic, that responsive search ads have been performing 40% better than the expanded text ads. Um, it's about 3.7% click-through rate. Uh, to think about a 2.4% click-through rate. And this would be across all of our higher education accounts. Um, so looking about trying to think of reasons why this happened is that the machine learning got better, but also the PPC community has had an extra year to learn how to better leverage responsive search ads, um, learn what works, and how it works differently from expanded text ads. And, and I think that has been probably the bigger driver um, for why our responsive search ads have gotten better. Um, kind of the lesson to learn here is that the machine learning, it can help us 
respond a little faster than the traditional ad formats can without having to write completely new ads. And maybe machine learning will be able to take what we already have, put it in a new way that uh, can perform even better than before. Um, and second with the bidding strategies. Um, so with bidding strategies, a lot of this we're specifically, I looked at cost per click, not cost per acquisition here, even though a lot of the, uh, a lot of the automated bid strategies center around that. Um, the reason for that is our, all of our higher education accounts, they have different conversion points. Some ask for applications, some are just leads, some are just going to an open house. So looking at all the education accounts together from conversions really wasn't useful, but looking at cost per click uh, always relates directly to your eventual eventual cost per acquisition. Um, what we saw with the bidding strategies is that during the beginning of the pandemic, the enhanced CPC and manual CPCs, those nearly doubled year over year during that time. Um, and also the maximized conversions did as well, but seeing accounts that had target CPA um, stayed about the same or went down about three, four percentage points. Um, the reasons there were enhanced CPC, you know, it can be slower to implement bid changes. Depending on how big your account is, you could have thousands of keywords you have to look at to implement bid changes. Um, with maximized conversions, um, I mean, we're seeing increased competition and maximized conversions is a more aggressive type of automated um, bidding strategy. And with increased competition, it, maximized conversions is going to drive a lot higher cost per click. Uh, for example, what I'm talking about with the increased competition is I'm looking back in auction insights reports in 2018, I'm only seeing like five competitors for some of my um, clients. 2019, I'll see 10. Uh, but within the last six months, I'll, I'll see like 17 competitors within my auction insight reports. Um, so I'm trying to be aware with my bidding strategies. I'm trying to pick more of the bidding strategy that are trying to be cost efficient. Um, I'm seeing using more target CPA than maximize conversions for a few of my clients. Um, kind of the lesson to learn there is that like the machine learning can help you respond quickly, but we still have to think and choose how we leverage and strategize around the different options we have uh, with all of our uh, machine learning options. Um, and then third, with diversifying your Google ad strategy, um, Probably the most significant thing with the COVID response is that there was a huge drop in traffic in March, uh, lasted about two to three weeks. Um, and this, I mean, that leads directly to, you know, a, a drop in leads across the board. Um, and that, that was specifically uh, in isolated, within search. So we're getting a lot less traffic, a lot less leads from search. Um, what helps with diversification there is that if we're able to still stay in front of people in display, in YouTube, uh, in social, besides having to be, these are places that aren't as high intent as Mike talked about before, but it helps those help build up, you know, the multiple brand engagements, multiple website visits that people have been talking about to still stay in front of people. And then that will benefits later and it benefits search later so that when people do have higher intent, um, they've already, they've still kept engaging with you over that time and you can capitalize on that later. Um, so yeah, just remember, if you haven't yet, uh, test your responsive search ads or keep working on them, adding new assets to them, check out your bidding strategies they're doing, and then just look into doing more 
adding more channels than just search. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. And uh, we do have the, the link to the, the blog post there. We will be following up with that resource as well as others. Uh, really encourage everyone on this to give that a read. All right. So um, I'm going to hop back in here. Uh, so as we know, marketing, age old adage uh, that um, you need to read the right, right person at the right time um, with the right message. And so while we're doing everything when it comes to attribution and, and bidding and using all of the data, making sure that we are getting the right message is still important. And so um, one of the things, again, that Google can bring to our premier partners and Granular in particular is some data specifically around COVID. And so this, these surveys have been going on um, quarterly and most, most recently coming back from September. So what we've learned, and this is in the sort of the non-traditional student, um, which is uh, 25 to, to 54, that, you know, most of them or a large portion are rushing to, uh, you know, online only. Um, most of that is coming from in person that they where they were, their enrollment status, but also from the, the hybrid model as well, mostly in, into uh, into online. And if we can move ahead one. Um, so the growth from more of your traditional students from 18 to 24, that growth is that growth is coming uh, at a similar rate into online, but in-person is, is way down uh, from, um, sep from June to September. So dropping 32%, almost twice as fast or more than twice as fast than the 25 to 24. Um, across both, what's crazy, 20%, you know, uh, you know around 20% for, for the unknown. Um, so those are some of the insights that are helpful in crafting the right messages. There's a couple of more that I wanted to share briefly. 45% um, of students can uh, expect to continue to on, uh, online or hybrid learning. So while we saw an, um, the growth of online learning before COVID, that acceleration is more expected to, to stick um, than probably we first anticipated. Um, the next thing, 34% of students say that the quality of online programs are negatively impacting their, their education. So if you messaging around, uh, you know, like positive um, student engagement with online, or if you had an online program beforehand and you have that expertise, that's the type of thing that I would encourage you to explore that messaging because it matters to students. A, a one more bit to that piece, 53% of students lack engagement from teachers or have that has a negatively impact their education. So if you have some great professor reviews and things that you can highlight in your messaging, not in, just in search or in anything across the board is, is something that we would encourage as well. Um, and then finally, 55% of prospective students' parents believe that COVID has impacted their ability to support their, their clients. That's a, a very sad stat. Um, and I hope that, that we can move uh, in a positive direction with supporting students in, in those parents. But if, if, again, when it comes to messaging around financial aid and being able to pay for school, that's another thing that might be good to highlight at this time. And these, these um, surveys are ongoing with the types of research that, that we can bring, bring to get granular. So um, hopefully that's something you can, you can use. Cool, thanks a lot, John and uh, Ian and Mike. I think we delivered some awesome content. Uh, with a few minutes left, uh, we do have a question that I wanna answer from Nathan. Um, he asked, uh, what are some key components to consider when trying to increase quality scores uh, of keywords you're bidding on? So quality score is definitely getting in the weeds. It's getting granular. Um, something that we love, we don't talk too much about with clients until we're like really sophisticated with educating them on what's important. Um, but uh, I can answer that for you now. Um, look, the biggest things that Google uh, talks about with quality score are the keyword relevance, the ad relevance, and the landing page experience, which means is it also relevant does it load quickly? Is it mobile friendly? Um, is it 
you know, a, g- a good experience. Um, there has have been hunches that there are over 200 other factors um, that are not published. Um, things like bounce rate, account structure, campaign history, match types, bid strategy. There's a lot of, that goes into quality score. Um, what I would suggest as a, just a quick test is to build out a SCAG, which is a single keyword ad group for one of your um, troubled uh, lower quality score keywords and really hone in on the ad quality and make sure that landing page is absolutely on point with that keyword you're bidding on. You should see uh, an improvement in quality score there. And then just a last tip on tracking quality score improvements. If you go into your ad, um, ad area within Google Ads and select a dimension uh, that shows, uh, it shows what keywords showed up for what ad, and you can actually have quality score as a column. So you can see this keyword actually had a lower quality score with this ad versus the other ad. That'll steer you in the right direction on how to improve your ad copy for quality score purposes. Awesome, thanks Jordan. We do have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, we'll answer Deanna Koch's question first, just cause it's a little more straightforward. What CRMs have you worked with? Um, what haven't we worked with? So the traditional CRMs, your sales forces, your, um, your HubSpot, Sugar CRMs, um, but then all of the higher ed specific, you know, CRMs. Uh, and again, you know, Ian and Mike and, and Jordan can probably jump in there, but your um, slates and your, you know, uh, Ian and Mike, you guys can probably talk to Black, through some Black other ones. Bod Black is Bod, one. pretty much any um, CRM. What we see is there, the higher ed industry attracts a lot of kind of specialty software providers, including uh, CRMs. So we've had to figure out how to work with pretty much all of them. Um, and then we do have another question here from Aggie Haney. Can you chat through how you adjust strategy for competing clients, especially as far as geographic market overlap? Yeah, Aggie, I mean, we've definitely run into this, right? If we're known as uh, paid search experts or higher ed experts, we've definitely had competing clients. Um, we really try to respect um, that privacy and we don't talk about who those are to each client. We don't say, hey, we're working with your competitor. We keep it really, uh, really quiet typically. Um, and we try to distribute that evenly amongst the team. So we really try not to have the same account manager manage uh, two competing schools um, and just really try to stay above board um, with the ethics there. Um, but also we see it's, it's interesting in that we see, um, you know, how important brand is, how much brand equity plays into, um, cost per click and conversion rate. You can have competing schools. Like I have first hand example of, of working at a competitor and then going to their competitor. Um, and I saw, you know, vastly different performance, um, vastly different, um, you know, everything about it was was different, even though we competed in the same geography, we offered the same degree. Um, there's just different ways to approach each school. So, um, you know, I guess the last thing I would say is we don't have a kind of a copy paste um, approach with anyone. Every school is handled differently. Um, every geography is handled differently. Um, so it's, it's really a unique experience, even if there are overlapping um, offerings within our, our uh, colleges we work with. Perfect, Jordan. And that uh, takes us right up to time here. Uh, for those of you who didn't have a question you asked here, but maybe you want to ask us, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, for those of you who attended. And then our emails are on the screen there, Jordan's email and my email if you want to reach out to us directly. Um, you can always go to granularmarketing.com and fill out the form there or chat with us if you prefer. Uh, we look forward to uh, chatting with you if we do connect. Uh, otherwise, thank you for attending. Thank you to all of our panelists, Jordan, John, uh, Mike, and Ian. And we're going to go ahead and uh, finish up here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.